So, fam, a lot of stuff's been going on. Yesterday, everything was crazy. We saw that the Chauvin trial came to an end. Um, well, for the time being, obviously, the sentencing is yeah. eight weeks away. And there's a lot that could happen between then, uh, from, from from now until mm -hmm. then. So we have to hold our breath and see what's going on. But with a situation like this, we want to bring in the right guest, the awesome guest, somebody who can give us a lot of perspective to what's going on. So we went out and got the heavy hitter. You know him. Uh, Mr. Garland Nixon is with us. How you doing today, Garland? Wonderful. Great to be back on. Now, it's great to have you on, yeah. man. I love to talk to you, uh, especially when I have a situation like this that we need to know. We need some insight here. Uh, there's a lot of things that went on last night, not just the whole trial coming to an end, but there was another shooting. We want to talk about that. And then we'll also talk a little bit about foreign policy because we know how you love the foreign policy, too, as well, uh, like us. But right off the bat, uh, now that Derek Chauvin has been convicted on all three counts, including murder, second degree, third degree, What's your reaction? I mean, would you call this a victory for justice, Garland? Well, not really. You know, I mean, you know, if the system worked right, um, George Floyd would still be alive. You know, so to me, it's no. It's it, when I look at it, I think to myself, OK, the most obvious case of murder that you could ever come up with, you know, a, just a blatant murder with a crowd of people standing around um, with a videotape on. The fact that we're all, you know, having a discussion as though this is a victory to me means it ain't a victory, if you know what I'm getting at. Because, you know, it's like, uh, let me give you an example. A while back, a couple years back, there was a guy named Mohammed Noor. Mohammed Noor was a Minneapolis police the police officer. He pulled up in an alley with another officer. A woman came up beside the car. She was white, uh, Australian woman of Australian origin, blonde hair. He shot her through the through the car window. She died. As soon as I saw it on the news, I'm like, well, he's going to be convicted and go to jail. I mean, as soon as I looked at it, it was like, A, it was obvious that he was wrong. And B, she was a blonde haired white woman. He was a black person. And I knew that the participants, who's the victim, who is the shooter, all of these things are of great consequence as to the outcome in this country. So, you know, what happens is something happens like Barack Obama gets elected and people are like, hey, it's the end of racism forever or one thing happens. And, you know, my mentor was Paul Robeson Jr. And he used to talk about that. He said, you know, like 65, 64, they um, would pass the Voting Rights Act or the Civil Rights Act or whatever. And a lot of black people would be like caught up in euphoria. Hooray. And then they go back to work and they get discriminated against somebody threatened them. Somebody called the N word. Their kid, their kid school was still se segregated and they'd wake up a, a, like a week or so later and go, wait a minute you know, one little thing that happened that seemed to be justice or seemed to be right didn't change the very nature and structure of the entire society that we yeah. live in. So, I, I, you know, to me, it's hard for me to celebrate. It's just like, okay, the right thing happened, but it was so obvious, The even the concept that anything else could have happened mm -hmm. other than that tells me that we're in a really screwed up society, messed up society and an unjust society. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's just like the one time people are seeing something go and people were still scared. That's how bad the system is that people thought were scared to think that he wouldn't because there's like because this rarely happens. The right thing rarely happens. Um, but, you know, despite all of this, uh, America's American police forces are still spending way more money than any other country's military. I mean, our police forces alone. Right. Except China. What has really changed in policing since the protests? A lot of people are saying, thank the protests. Thank, thanks to the protests, this happened. Do you really think anything has changed in policing? And do you really think that the protests had uh, any influence on the George Floyd trial? Not on the trial itself, I think, because the video was so overwhelming. Yeah. You know, the um, the there were reports that members of the juror were kind of wincing, you know, and who would when you watch somebody being killed right in front of you and close up in high definition, video, you know, video. So I don't think that I think this trial was so clear and cut, you know, that it, I don't think that the. Um, the jurors looked at what was going on on the outside and saw this I issue as, hey, we've got to do this because if, if it's, it's a part of some gigantic, gi gigantic justice movement or something. But I, I do think that what the protests did was put some pressure 
on politicians. Um, I've heard today now that the D Department of Justice is going to come in and they're going to do one of those uh, practices, you know, the one of those investigations like they did in Baltimore, where they look into the long term practices of the Minneapolis Police Department. I think those things are good because, you know, you get some data out of it. It does put some pressure on police departments. Um, but I've always been one. And, you know, Maybe I'm making things too broad. I've always been one as a former law enforcement. I've seen things happen in and out of law enforcement to believe the problem we have is, a, is an American problem. The problem we have is a social and a, a cultural problem here in America that we have never dealt with. We will never deal with the cultural realities in America. We'll never deal with what happened to the Native Americans. There are a bunch of Native Americans right now languishing on these uh, reservations in dire poverty. Yeah. They were put here by America. This needs, they need to be made whole. Their land was stolen. So we've got all of these things that America just sweeps under the rug and pretends like it's not a reality. And this continues to go on. And we act like we can just take one little piece of it. Right. and fix it without um, addressing the, the sickness that is America. And, I, and you know, I talk about foreign policy. Look, what do we do? We go to Afghanistan, Iraq, whatever. We mow a bunch of innocent civilians down. We blow them up. And then what does America do? When the International Criminal Court says, we're going to look into America for war crimes, we sanction the people in the International Criminal Court and say, we don't want our guys carrying guns, killing innocent brown people to be held accountable for murdering those brown people people. Is it shocking? We did, I always say this, the exact same thing that we do in, a, in, in foreign policy is what we do domestically. The difference between foreign policy and domestic policy is grammatical and nothing mm -hmm. else. That's, that's amazing. I don't know, though, Garland, because uh, you can listen up over here. Nancy Pelosi had some words to say, and she, I mean, you know, um, you tell me, listen to what Nancy Thousands, Pelosi millions said. Millions of people Thank you, George Floyd, for sacrificing your life for justice, for being there to call out to your mom. How, how heartbreaking was that? Call out for your mom. I can't breathe. But because of you and because of thousands, millions of people around the world who came out for justice, your name will always be synonymous with justice. Thank you, George Floyd. I mean... Not only the fact that she shouldn't be speaking at all, it should have been somebody like Keith Ellison or Jamal Bauman or a man of color who should have had the chance to speak and she should have stepped back and listened for a change. The fact that she's politicizing it and making it look like it's the Democrats who are on the side of truth and justice. Meanwhile, their lackey that's in office right now that controls the White House signed the not only the Patriot Act was for every single war, he signed the 1994 crime bill. He wrote it too. You know, he wrote this shit. I mean... <laughs> Garland, your reaction to this right away? Yeah, it's absurd. I mean, it's the equivalent of putting on a kenta cloth and kneeling. You know, that's what they do. Something symbolic, something abstract. I mean, no, George Floyd didn't volunteer to be killed. I he know. didn't be like, hey, kill me to make things better for everybody else. No, he didn't. He wasn't planning on dying, but it was poorly worded because all she's she's going to say something. Show me the legislation that you are um, that you are putting forward. Show me how you're fighting Joe Biden to tell him to stop giving more uh, military equipment to the police department. He's given more in the last few months than Trump has given at any yeah. point, uh, point over that period of time. So show me where you're willing to push back against some. Here's the thing. To push back against someone in your own party, you will never, ever push back against someone in your own party. The rules on Capitol Hill are you're allowed to attack the other party, but you're never allowed to push back on your own party. So that sounds great. But, you know, show me something that she's doing. You know what I mean? Something tangible, something you're actually trying to change. I don't want to hear symbolic symbolism yeah. in words. And it ain't happening. Yeah. And who came back for more symbolism, Garland, was none other than Barack Obama, who praised George Floyd, uh, the jury, and said, we need more uh, action. He said, we cannot rest. Uh, <laughs> let's remind everybody, Barack Obama was the one that, you know, had that whole fake drinking in the Flint, Flint Michigan. Black Lives Matter started under his presidency. And, you know, Barack Obama is responsible for disastrous regime change wars with Hillary Clinton and not only in Central America, but of course, the Libyan slave trade. I mean, this is all this is this is what irritates me the most 
uh, with this movement uh, is that it is so easily weaponized by the Democratic Party establishment for political points. How do we escape that? Like, how do how do people I don't know. How do we make people see that these people only care for for the weaponization of it? Uh, they're weaponizing George Floyd's death now. Well, I think you're doing it now. I think, you know, all we can do is the alternative media stuff. Certainly we're going to be attacked. But the other thing about it is, here's the thing I remember about Barack Obama, because when these things happen, you need to have an honest discussion about them, right? You need to put them out there in an honest way. You remember his buddy Skip Gates was coming home and he was at his own house. It was a white neighborhood and the cops grabbed him and didn't want to believe. And if you remember, they arrested him. He was a Harvard professor and didn't believe he Work, he lived in this neighborhood and Barack Obama found out. At, now, there's an instance to have a real conversation. He had a beer summit. He invited the cop that did it to the White House and had a jolly little beer summit about it. And that was, again, worthless, hollow symbolism. Hey, we'll have a beer. And that like kind of symbolized the two of them getting along. Well, this wasn't about the two of them getting along. And it is and it's never about one officer. That's why I got to add this in. That's why I so push back in any language that implies bad apples, this officer, individual officers. Anytime somebody says, well, what are we going to do to get rid of the bad apples? I always say <laughs> that's the wrong language because that protects the institution. Right. That says there's no institutional problems. There's a few individual officers that are bad guys, exactly. whatever bad actually means, or they're making bad decisions in, in, in implying that they're you know, it was a mistake rather than this is a broad societal cultural problem and it's cultural within law enforcement, but it's not created. And I'll say this from law enforcement. It's not created by law enforcement. It's like if someone's got a bunch of kids, somebody's got five kids. They never hold them accountable for anything. They, they let them run around. They do anything they want to. And they, when the kids get to school, you know what? They're going to be in trouble all the time. When they get out of school, they're going to be locked up. Why is that? Because they were never held accountable for anything. And their parents had absolutely no discipline whatsoever in the house. Run around, do whatever you want. You'll never get in any trouble. That's the culture in America that created this problem in law enforcement. The problem in law enforcement is created because law enforcement is not held accountable for these things. Therefore, they're, they're in an unregulated environment when it comes to use of force, particularly against minorities or, or add this homeless people. They can shoot, beat yeah, murder, yeah. homeless people, yeah. the lesser groups. Yeah. You know, it's 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 they freedom to treat them any way they want to. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I remember when you in the show before, too, you talked about it, like what's the number one change we need to have in law enforcement? And that is the fact that they can't have the ability to look at themselves. In other words, to not, investigate. Not, to investigate themselves or to, yeah, to to make sure that, you know, that, that they can't be the ones to hold themselves accountable. It has right. to be an outside source. And you talked about how to get that done. We're nowhere near moving that. And I don't think anything really systemically has changed within the police de departments across America. In fact, they've been given more money, more weapons. And even though we might have had a... a, a, a a conviction that was finally saying that we're going to hold somebody accountable. Hey, the sentences is the sentencing is eight weeks away. There's already talk that they're going to get an appeal because of what Maxine Waters said, and you know to maybe move the the jury a certain way. So we're not even out of the woods right now. And I I can never imagine a place that Derek Chauvin is going to go to a serious prison. If anything, they're going to say he's a security risk, and they're going to put him in one of those like you know resorts that have golf and whatnot. But he just you know accounted for and stuff like that. So I mean. Uh, I, I just don't know where we're at and, and if we're even moving into a place uh, where we can actually change what's going on with policing in America. There are some, and you know, I'm reticent to say this, but I got to say this. There are some positive things. There are a few. Please. Um, as, as an example, in Maryland, so some years back, a few years back, I worked for the American Civil Liberties Union. I worked at the legislature um, and working to get um, new uh, laws passed to address uh, police misconduct. And we had very, very little progress. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, we had good stuff. We had a huge uh, coalition of groups and I worked help putting them together. And we went to Annapolis and we worked and most of that stuff got tossed right out you know <laughs> this year a number of the things that they worked 
through, worked for, passed. Things that I never thought would pass in a million years passed, including one of them is when law enforcement officers are involved in um, homicides, then uh, the police department won't investigate it, that it'll go to like the AG's office or something like that. So that is at least a start. I mean, you know, it's not okay. going to be that. So there are some things happening somewhere. But keep in mind, while that happens in some states, you're going to have other states where you have the old pushback, you know, yep. like DeSantis passing these anti-protest yep. laws. Terrible. So you're going to get one foot forward, and, you know, one step back. forward and yeah. two steps back in some areas. Um, but there are some things that are happening that, as we were discussing, if it weren't for the protest, and sadly, I mean, if we are honest about this thing, fear. Let's be completely honest here. You know, there's the info, there's the famous story of Nixon and Kissinger, where they were, you know, the during the Vietnam protest, and they had these buses lined up in front of the White House and to, to keep the, the 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 protesters from getting into the White House. And Nixon looked at Kissinger and he's like, they're going to break, get, break through that line. They're going to come in here. They're going to get us, aren't they? He was afraid. And there are people that argue sometimes politicians won't do anything unless they're afraid. I, I do believe, and I'm not saying I'm in favor or opposed it. It is what it is. This is what happened. I think to some level, the fires that we saw, the protesting, the things being broken down and the, you know, looting all those things happening over the summer probably put fear in and i'm not saying it's good bad or indifference i'm just saying this is what happened yeah, some yeah. of that probably put fear in some of these people and they're like yeah these people are going to freak out if we don't do something so we better do a little something unfortunately yeah. sometimes that's the way it works i just i wanted to ask one thing before you go before you ask that question i mean just before we get to this next part though garland at the end of the day what do we really need to do I, we we talk about this all the time. It's not really about like it's it's not all about policing and the tactics they use. It's what causes a lot of people to come in contact with police, homelessness and being in poverty. Uh, we talk about Medicare for all and how it would just help so much with the mental illness problem. Where a lot of police officers they're not a fucking doctor. How are they gonna show right. up and handle the situation with a person who is like mentally ill and needs help? So I mean, wouldn't those be the core reasons to really help? The whole policing in America is to fix the systemic issues of uh, of Medicare for all and poverty and homelessness. Oh, absolutely. You know, there. I mean, you know, what's interesting is you always see these um, like uh, poll. I mean, the, like uh, uh, these various numbers of how many black people were arrested for this or that or this violent crime versus how many white people. But you know what you don't see? You don't see those demographics mm -hmm. based on economics. Exactly. What if you were to do to see the same demographic? I've always argued. You say, okay, uh, how many black people versus how many white people versus how many Latinos? Okay, let's do this. How many people who are living under the poverty line exactly. or 20% under the poverty line or 30% under the poverty line? You know what you would find? You would find that those numbers of black and white started to align that it was a matter of poverty when you say more black people may be in, are, are more likely to be impoverished, more Latinos are more likely to impoverish, be impoverished, but you go into the poor white communities, you're going to see the lines of crime and things like that start to align, wherein people start to realize this is an economic and class issue. Yes, it is very much a race issue, but there's an economic and class issue too. I was a police officer and I used to always say, you know what? I didn't arrest a whole lot of people with college degrees. I didn't arrest a whole lot of people who were wealthy, middle class or upper middle class. Yeah. You arrest people and you talk to them and you go into a prison. You know what you find? Horror stories. People who were um, uh, 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 tossed out of foster care at 18 and they're like, okay, you're 18, you're out here on the street. And they were out there involved in prostitution, crime. What They didn't even know how to survive. They knew nothing. Didn't even have a decent education or GED. People who were suffered abuse, violent abuse, sexual abuse. You don't go into a women's pr prison and you're lucky to find anyone woman there who wasn't some victim of violent sexual abuse at a young age. So we don't uh, deal with the social and, and, and economic factors that put people's lives in, in danger and put them in a bad situation. So by the time they become, um, you know, old enough to be a part of society, they're broken human beings. So while this was happening with the Derek uh, Chauvin trial wrapping up and, and him being found guilty of George Floyd's murder, there was a 15-year-old girl, I'm sorry, 16-year-old girl who was killed 
Um, she was shot four times by an officer. She called the cops herself because she was being jumped on her residence. Now, she is in foster care at that residence. Her mother was actually in contact with her. They were going to meet the next day. So she grabbed a knife to defend herself um, because she was in this altercation with these with these other people. And there were multiple people there. Then the cop went in as soon as he got there, didn't ask questions, did nothing, shot four shots at her. She was laying on the ground, bleeding. Um, she she then died. And then the mayor reportedly stated that the officer took action to protect another young member of our community. So as an ex-police officer, how would you classify this shooting? And we can just play the video in the background, Johnny. Yeah. That way we can be discussing yeah. it. Well, here there are a couple of things here because here's the first discussion you'll hear amongst people. Well, she did have a she did have a knife, she did have a we have right. a weapon and she was a threat. Okay, but here's the other part of it. Go online and start searching um armed white male attack police. And you know what you'll find? You'll find video after video. There's one where the cops are at the at the guy's window and he, they're going, "You've got a gun on the seat." And he's like, "Yes, and I'll shoot you." And they're like, no, don't do that. And, and you're like, well, there's there's how about Kyle Rittenhouse? He right. shoots people and walks by the cops. You're like, hey, dude, what's up? You know, what about the guy in um, in uh, South Carolina shoots nine people in the church? The cops pick him up and they friggin take Dylan. him to Burger yeah. King and buy him lunch on their dime. Yep. So we, you see instance after instance, the other instance, uh, I was just watching a video a few minutes ago, two cops are rolling around on the ground, a male and a female with this guy. The guy gets one of the cops nightstick and he's beating the woman in the head with it. Two cops. <laughs> he's beating the one cop with the nightstick. He then jumps up. They just chase him. He gets in the police car, steals the car, drives away. They never fire around. So here's the issue. If you make an argument, in any instance and say, well, in that instance, I can say there is justification for the officers to shoot. Then I say, okay, here's 10 other in, uh, uh, instances where there was much more justification for the shoot, but they elected not to. They used their discretion and said, you know what, in this instance, I'll try another way, I'll do something else. And I'm not saying they were wrong. I'm saying that's the right thing. You didn't have to kill that guy. And the same way here, did you just, but there's no discretion, it appears, when there is a minority there, when there's a black person there, when there's a homeless person there, when there's people in these groups that aren't counted. There's the discretion, the decision to say, technically speaking, I could pull the trigger, but in this instance, I elect not to, that just doesn't happen. And that's the issue. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the uh, police aren't there to be judge, jury, and executioner. That's the other thing. I mean, I, I want to ask you, though, what happened to tasers? What what happens to rubber bullets? And what happened to Biden's shoot him in the leg? I mean, not like that. All of that could have happened uh, potentially. But I mean, what do, like do the, do these officers not have those weapons? Well, you know, again, see, there's a term, you know, I was a, 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 a police uh, a trainer. I ran our academy. And what's the term? Officer discretion. You talk about that a lot in training, the discretion of, of an officer. You train an officer. When you're on the scene, for instance, um, I come upon the scene and you're violating the law. I can elect to write you a ticket. I can elect to write you a warning. I can elect to get you give you a verbal warning. And it is an obvious violation of the law, but I can elect to just walk by and let you keep doing it, right? Yeah. Officers have a pretty good amount of di discretion. So that's what it comes down to. What we don't, what, what officers aren't trained is the issue of discretion. And in particularly when it comes to the use of force and when it comes to the use of force against particular groups. The mm -hmm. other, you know, when you talk about training, most of the time, the, the, the training pretends as though things are color, colorblind, right? Mm -hmm. the, tra the training for an officer is if somebody does this, you do that. If somebody says that, you do that. This is your option. This is when you can and can't do this. What we need in reality is, is, is real training. Where we where we actually lay it on the line and say, you know, look, you're a police officer and historically officers have been more likely to do this against minorities or black, black people, Latino or whatever, where we lay it on the line and, and, and use the truth. But America would have to. Here's the problem. The United States would have to admit some things that the U.S. doesn't want to admit. We and instead, it's a lot easier to point to one officer 
and say that guy's a bad apple to pour it to Derek Chauvin and say he's the bad guy we just got the devil out of the everything's good now he's done <laughs> Uh, before you go into that, uh, a lot of leftists are talking now about police abolition. For me, police police abolition is not literally not having anybody there to help out when you get mobbed or when there's something else that they mean, like not the police policing done in the way that it's being done now. Right. Like a complete and total change. Uh, that is also up for debate because different people have different meanings, just like with defunding the police, all of that. What do you think about police abolition? For me, you can't talk about abolishing the police if you're not talking about the Pentagon or the national security state or the military apparatus, because that the the policing, in my opinion, in the United States is but a uh, just a, a smaller version of our military and you talk about it all the time right we go around the world we go kill people around the world it's the same thing so if you're going to talk about police abolition i feel like it is um you're missing a huge portion of it if you're not talking about how america operates foreign policy wise i'm 100 percent i i agree with you 100 percent. and I, and i'm I, you know i preach that a lot and i get a lot of pushback because you have the people who are like oh well we're fighting in america for black lives matter whatever the case may be right, and i right, say right. i say i think you're wasting your time i think you're not completely wasting your time but a lot if you really want systemic change you have to address the system this is a violent system the things that we do people are like there's too many guns and they push too many guns in society well, you know what we did in syria what did <laughs> we do in syria what did barack obama do with office with 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 um with uh, operation timber sycamore right yeah. we pump tons and tons and tons of yeah. military, military hardware into a small yeah. country here yeah. and there and they know what do you know people are getting shot all over the place and that's <laughs> the th same thing that's going on here if yeah. palestinian lives don't matter you can't allow you can't it, and see here's the thing and, and i found this too there are a lot of people that work on these uh you know nonprofits and they work for you know for let's just say this kinds of stuff but here's what they know if you and i the three of us start a nonprofit tomorrow and we're going to work on anti racism stuff in the u.s that's fine and we'll get money from god only knows who the maybe the ford foundation the king the knight whoever will get money stuff like that we can raise money but as soon as we say, oh, by the way, the Palestinians, oh, by the way, we want to stop this war that we're starting with so and so. We don't agree with overthrowing um, uh, the what, you know, name the list of countries that we're trying to overthrow. All that money's drying up. You're not going to get on any TV program anymore. And you are on the third rail and you get electrocuted on the third rail. So that's the key to me that lets you know that that's where you really need to address because they will allow you to talk about this stuff. But if you start bringing them and blending them together, you have problems. You're not going to get any money anymore. You're not going to get any support. You're toast. You're going to be called like a Putin bot or so. God only knows what. Speaking of Putin, and by the way, Operation uh Sycamore Timber or Timber Sycamore, I always get it mixed up. It's one or the other. But, timber Sycamore. Uh, yeah, they took the guns out of Libya and they moved them over into Syria, and that was just just crazy. Uh, and you're a foreign policy guy. Here's a little snippet from an article uh, from Moon of Alabama, which is one of my favorite. Uh, oh, yeah, they're great. Great to go to there. It's, check this out. It says, this is fun to watch. U.S. Navy ships were supposed to sail into the Black Sea in show of support for Ukraine and to send specific send a specific message to Moscow due to concerns about mounting tensions between Ukraine and Russia. Moscow then let it be known that it was not amused about the obviously pre-planned provocation. We warned the United States that it would be better for them to stay far, far away from Crimea and our Black Sea coast. It will be for their own good. <clears throat> This has been hysterical uh, this whole this whole time. And you mentioned earlier in the show about how our foreign policy uh, directly relates to the violence that we bring back here at home. What grade do you give Joe Biden so far for his foreign policy, especially pertaining towards this debacle in Russia? A Z. I give him a Z <laughs> only because that's as bad as I can think. It's his his foreign policy is unfathomably horrifying i mean i just searching for words to say this guy's been here for three months three months roughly o along the border of colombia and venezuela the cia's got firefights going on there yeah he's moved more troops into syria 
And now, and they're looting the oil in Syria, and there's a troop buildup in Syria. That we were Trump had set to leave Afghanistan May first, and Obama and, and Biden. Net, we're not leaving. People are like, oh, we're leaving in uh, September 11th. Here's what I say: If an alcoholic said to you, if you said you need to quit drinking, and he says, I'll quit in four months, would you believe him? <laughs> of course yeah, not. You put he that quit tweet in up. Four months. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we have that tweet we have up that when tweet. we interviewed Jimmy Dore. <laughs> we put it up. We're like, no, you know, we, what? It's, <laughs> we're not going to get out of Afghanistan. That, that's the good part. That <laughs> yeah. is the scary part. So now this guy goes to uh, China and he's menacing China. And he's like, if you try to take Taiwan, why we'll go to war. Well, every um, war game scenario in history between the U.S. and China and Russia ends in nuclear war and the annihilation of all humankind. Mm -hmm. I had a guy call my rate my Pacifica radio show. Don't you think we should uh, protect Taiwan? And I'm like, <laughs> most Americans have no clue where it is on a map. Yeah. yeah, and we're going to end all of humankind to protect some to quote protect it. First of all, how are you protecting them if they're all dead? and we're all dead. What kind of protection is that? Next, Ukraine, which is a country that the government overthrew under Barack Obama, yep. and now, which is not a country, excuse me, it is a colony of the United States. It is not a country, it is not an independent country, it is a broken, failed, impoverished state that is used as a proxy battlefield against Russia. Somehow, these idiots in Ukraine were convinced to put their military up against Eastern Ukraine and threaten the Russians, put their military in the area of Crimea, threaten the Russians. And the Russians put two armies and three divisions of, of, of airborne basically surrounded them. So, so here we sit with the Ukrainian military, which would not even be a speed bump for the Russian army. They wouldn't be a speed bump. They'd be wiped out. The Russians in two days, three days would be in Kiev if they decided to. So we've put them up there, the, uh, uh, up to this. Certainly they can't very well attack because they'd be wiped out immediately. Yeah. But here's the other side of it. If in fact the president of Ukraine, who's got all these neo-Nazis in his parliament and all that stuff, if he backs down and retreats, the mad neo-Nazis in his country will now turn on him and say, you back down to the evil Russians. So he can't move forward or his military gets wiped out by the Russians. If he backs backs off, then he's going to be facing the mad neo-Nazis in his government. So he's in an untenable catch-22 position. So yep. what happens now? And the Russians are clear. We don't want any trouble. But if this guy starts any trouble, we're going to end it in a hurry. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and let me add this. The, the nickname militarily for the Black Sea is Putin's Lake. It's completely, I mean, it's completely <laughs> covered with missiles and submarines and everything by the Russians. There's no point in sending a couple. I mean, it would be suicide yeah, to yeah, send a couple yeah. of ships in there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and on top so, of and it, it's absurd. They uh, I, I think this is a different Russia than it was four years ago. And I think the Joe Biden and Jake Sullivan and, and Blinken are learning that quickly. Uh, you know, they said uh, it's best to not come in here because it's going to be some serious problems. Uh, and then they cut off the Ukrainian uh, uh, Navy from doing any actions and said, you're not going anywhere. We're going to show you what's what. Uh, and uh, now Zelensky is calling for a meeting with Putin because he's scared. He doesn't know what to do. He listened to the Americans. You know, they did some drone actions from some drones in Turkey, but they're in a very serious situation. And people don't realize that we facilitated that. You know, we right. supported this regime change on the Maidan where they, you know, set police uh, police personnel on fire and stuff that were trying to protect the government at the time. It was really, really disgusting. And it was backing neo-Nazis, the same neo-Nazis we've been backing since the end of World War II. It is a foobar situation, fucked up beyond all recognition. Uh, thank you for your opinion. Johnny, you... Oh. I'm sorry, do you have Did a Did you have a question, Johnny? No? Garland, I'm curious about what you think about Turkey's role in all this uh, uh, regarding the Black Sea and everything. Because, you know, to get to the Black Sea, you got to go through, uh, uh, you know, that inlet right there, right next to Istanbul. So I was kind of curious about your thoughts on that. A couple of quick things about that. One of the interesting things about the um, the this whole Ukraine buildup, I'm glad you asked that. Think about this. The Ukrainians start this buildup uh, on the on the you know on the the Ukrainian military around Crimea and around eastern Ukraine where the Russian speakers are right. The, in response, the Russians then start a buildup, a much larger buildup. So the U.S. says we're going to send a couple ships into the Black Sea to let the Russians know who's boss. Turkey reveals 
that they made the request to send the show to send the ships in weeks ago. So it wasn't a response to the Russians. They were really going to send it in when the Ukrainians started the buildup. And then once the Russians did it, they're like, yeah, we're, it's, a, it's a response to the Russians, of course, until the, they found that the Russians were quite unhappy about it. They decided not to do about it, do anything. But Turkey's, it, it's really weird. Um, Erdogan's a dangerous guy. He's, he is. Oh, he's yeah. all over the place. He's in Libya. He's in Syria. He's one minute, he's trying to be friendly with the Russians and he's buying S-400 anti-aircraft stuff. The next minute, he's back to NATO and he's blaming the Ukrainians. He seems to be an unstable stable guy and might i mention that the turkish lira is on a precipitous downfall yeah, it is. so his own country has an economic disaster going on this guy is pretty unstable and scary what he, he is basically an unstable international player in my opinion yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the last questions i want to ask garland that kind of ties everything together is we've been seeing a lot of abuses um on our First Amendment rights, our civil liberties, when it comes to the coverage of of protests. Uh, and also that directly relates to Julian Assange. We had a lot of people who were, um, you know, a lot of us were saying, hey, look, look at how these protesters and these journalists specifically are being treated in Minneapolis, Minnesota uh, for covering these protests. They're, they're being, you know, pushed into a gas station, having to lay down, get their face uh take a picture of they had their credentials uh photographed they had they they were treated and at gunpoint too to get out of their cars simultaneously a lot of us have been talking about julian assange and julian assange's coverage of course and exposure of u.s war crimes western war crimes in general and how he is of course in belmarsh prison right now awaiting uh, the attempt of, of extradition into the United States. So a lot of people don't see that relationship there. Why, why, does, why does the First Amendment and Julian Assange matter so much? And how could we relate that better to people who are protesting, whether it's the Black Lives Matter movement or any protest for that matter? Because a lot of people are missing that connection. And I think that connection is as important as seeing our foreign policy and our domestic policy and the whole police state as a uh, in, in, as a, you know, as a super, super, super seed. Well, I think what we're seeing, this is this creeping authoritarianism, and it's really catching up with us in a hurry. You know, you just get two different versions of it, two different flavors of authoritarianism. Trump had one th flavor of authoritarianism that was pretty outright and blatant. And it was like, you're going to do what we say or else. What the heck with you? Whereas the Biden-Harris authoritarianism is authoritarianism with a smile. You know, we kind of say we're here to act in your best interest and yeah. we're here to help you. But think about this. Again, what do you go? What, what, what happens when it's foreign policy? Trump goes in and says, "We're going to steal the oil. We like the oil. We're taking the oil." He's straightforward, right? We're yeah. thugs and we're thieves. And Biden and people, we're there. What about the women? We can't leave Afghanistan because the women's wrong. It's the same thing. It's an authoritarianism that's expressing itself here, and they have to do this. They have no choice because their policies would be if. If most Americans clearly understood the policies of their government, they would oppose them. So they have to lie to us constantly. And those of us who try to actually tell the truth, or at least, I'm not saying the three of us are truth tellers. Here's what I'm saying. We're at least making an effort to evaluate what's going on here, honestly. We, there's not an agenda that we have where we have to have some clandestine agenda to move some policy a suite of policies forward. We're looking at we, what we see, and this is what the press is supposed to do, looking at what we see, discussing it honestly, and reporting it. In an authoritarian regime, you can't have that because it's all a bunch of lies. And so what is, uh, Julian Assange is the most per perfect example because the one thing that you can't do in this kind of an authoritarian empire is tell the truth. They can stand a lot of things, but they can't take, tell the truth. And so Julian Assange, you know, I, I, I'll say something else. I think the world has learned a lot from the transition from Trump to Biden. And, it, and, and I've talked to people in the um, in, 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 in a, um, foreign policy and, and international security analysts in Europe and different parts of the world, because this is what they learned. 
the message to the world and everybody was things are so our our foreign policy is so unhinged things are so crazy here because of trump and once trump's gone yeah everything will smooth right out america's back blah 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 Biden comes in, our foreign policy goes even crazier. Yeah. And nothing really when it comes to the policies here, you know. Now, there's a few f- economic and domestic policies that are different, but when it comes to the policies of dealing with people, with human beings, with the government addressing your freedoms, yeah, they're pretty much the same. And I think a lot of people in the world have realized, wait a minute. We were told that was Trump, 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 Trump. That's American policy. That's who this country is. And whoever they put in, that's what you're going to get. Yeah. 100%. Yep. Uh, uh, Garland, you're amazing. This yeah. is your second time on. You got to be a regular here. As soon as you jumped on, the numbers went shooting up today. We got over <laughs> 300 on YouTube. That was that was coming from Langley. That was the CIA. Oh, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what Fort it is. Mead. I mean, you know, come on. Well, I mean, I can still. There's a million more questions I like to ask you. I think that we I have got to pay time attention. If you want to stick with whatever you want to do. Okay. Well, we'll do another show soon because I think okay. we we should pay attention to the protests that are going out there right now. You know, uh, with Black Lives Matter and stuff, and we talked about the Proud Boys, Black Lives Matter, Antifa, uh, Boogaloo Boys. It's all such a small, small piece of what's really going on. You've always mentioned before, uh, but I think we should too. pay attention to the protests and how they're being uh, how they're being manufactured out there. If they are for real, if they are genuine, do we have the right leaders in? place we should keep an eye on this have you back and then talk about this more down the road garland thank you so much for coming on thank all you, right garland. thank you guys happy be- that's a badass shirt by the way <laughs> yeah. although i'm a banana republic guy man i love banana republic it fits me perfect <laughs> and like you said on your tweet defund the elite ruling class <laughs> that's who we gotta defund baby predator class the predator class needs to go thank all you right. garland thanks a lot you all appreciate all right. you